Fabius was born on terror into a noble European family. He spent his childhood in a district called Ingolstadt. In his childhood, he learned the art of flesh crafting from one of the servants of his family. Among his early experiments was the modification of mice for duels with each other in intricate attire, and he was distraught when they did not obey his commands and killed each other. Soon after, he enlisted in the Third Legion. The 42nd millennium became increasingly fraught with truly apocalyptic events. The return of Primarchs, the devastating campaigns of Abaddon, and the unimaginable ambitions of those who had hitherto lurked in the shadows became commonplace. Under the leadership of Talos Valcoran, known as the Prophet, the remnants of the Night Lords faced ongoing challenges due to the degradation of their gene seed and the constant attrition of warfare. Despite these obstacles, they continued to launch raids and engage in warfare, using whatever means available to replenish their numbers, including the recruitment and initiation of new members, often without regard for the purity of their gene seed, embracing the chaotic mutations as marks of favor from the Dark Gods. The implementation of gene seed accelerated, and new recruits were sent to the front, although it was unknown whether they were infected or not. Among the recruits was the young Fabius Bile, whose role as an apothecary in the Emperor's Children Legion involved not only collecting the gene seed of the fallen, but also conducting radical genetic experiments. His work, driven by a quest for perfection and transcendence beyond the human and Astartes form, led him down a dark path of experimentation. Bile's legacy is not one of seeking cures, but of seeking to overcome the limitations of flesh through any means, moral or otherwise, often resulting in grotesque outcomes. His experiments aim to enhance and manipulate Astartes' biology, eventually leading him to become one of the most infamous figures in the Warhammer 40,000 universe for his relentless pursuit of genetic manipulation and immortality. After extensive work with the gene seed of his fallen brethren, Fabius Bile delved deeper into genetic manipulation, driven by a quest for perfection and the transcendence of physical limits. Contrary to any notion of executing infected comrades for the sake of purity, Fabius's actions were guided by his own ambition and the pursuit of knowledge, often at the expense of those around him. His experiments were not aimed at curing a specific ailment, but at enhancing and transforming the Astartes of the Emperor's children beyond their original design. His relentless experimentation led him to use the genetic material of his legionnaires to further his own research into immortality and perfection. Despite the introduction of purer gene seed sources to the Legion, Fabius's own suffering was not of a physical disease, but a relentless drive towards achieving his own twisted version of evolution, making him one of the most feared and reviled figures in the galaxy. His family suffered from tumors, but the genetic code could not be altered. Fabius began to extend his life through mechanical and scientific means. At the same time, efforts were actively made to find a cure. Thus, Fabius became the sole survivor of the Legion's original composition. Due to his peculiar appearance, his soldiers began to call him Spider. When the Horus Heresy began, Fabius, being on the side of the traitors, gained access to all forbidden knowledge for his biological research. Fabius also participated in the attempt to exorcise a demon from Fulgrim, when Primarchs felt significant changes in his behavior and decided to cleanse him of demonic influence. Fabius began with ancient methods of interrogation, demonstrating his numerous torture devices and explaining how they would be used. They were both simple tools that any metal or woodworker could use. Hammers, pliers, nails, welding pistols, awls, planes, low-speed drills, and more exotic instruments of suffering. Nerve clamps, organ solvents, bone puncture drills, and brainstem irritants. With this last device, I will take particular pleasure, said Fabius, inserting several metal spikes into Fulgrim's spine. He rotated the frame on which Fulgrim lay around its longitudinal axis, exposing the mutilated shoulders and back, resembling a torn canvas of scars and still healing wounds. For Lucius, Primarch's flesh expressed an admiration-worthy zeal, a deliberate pursuit of the sweet agony that only a true connoisseur of pain could achieve. What is it and what does it do? asked one of Fabius Bile's acolytes, intrigued by the latest creation of their master. 
Fabius, always eager to share the fruits of his dark research, revealed a twisted grin. It's a neuroparasite, a masterpiece of genetic engineering and technological perversion. I've crafted it from the spliced genetic material of several Xeno species, known for their psychic abilities, and combined it with advanced nanotechnology, he replied. You didn't answer his question, Marius said sharply. This parasite, when introduced to a host, integrates with the nervous system, enhancing or subjugating the host's neural functions. It can induce excruciating pain, manipulate memories, or even control the host's actions, making it a potent tool for interrogation or subversion. Fabius Bile, ever the pioneer of forbidden knowledge, viewed even the most revered figures within the Emperor's children with a detached curiosity, driven by his quest to unlock the secrets of life itself. While Fulgrim, their Primarch, was worshipped by many within the Legion, Fabius saw in him the ultimate specimen for study, a being of immense psychic and physical power from whom unimaginable scientific breakthroughs could be gleaned. However, this blasphemous perspective was met with disgust by Lucius, who saw Fabius's irreverence as a betrayal of their legion's ideals and Fulgrim's divine status. The device Fabius pondered over, laden with technology both arcane and xenos derived, symbolized the schism between their visions. One sought perfection through the blade, the other through the scalpel. The serum, a concoction of xenos origin designed to unlock and manipulate psychic potential, was a testament to Fabius's ambition to transcend the limitations of flesh and mind. An ambition that horrified those who still held some semblance of loyalty to their Primarch and the Emperor's vision. And what will this achieve? Lucius asked, though he already suspected what the answer would be. All mortal beings are simply machines, Fabius said. Mechanical animals made of flesh and blood, but controlled by mechanistic principles, essentially. What we mistakenly consider personality or character is merely a form of reaction to stimuli. And it's possible to create a fully functional machine copy of personality, indistinguishable from a living creature, if you build a complex enough algorithm. And knowing this, we can stimulate certain areas of the brain, amplifying the manifestations we desire and blocking out the rest. I could take a newborn and smash its head against a wall in front of its mother. And this device would make her experience insane delight if I wished. Or I could lightly touch someone's chest and they would feel as if I were ripping out their heart with my bare hands. Then what are the other instruments for? Kesseron inquired his curiosity piqued by the array of terrifying devices in Fabius's lab. While this device is capable of making someone believe they are being burned alive without a single flame, there is something to be said for the more direct methods of inflicting pain. They carry a certain primal appeal, Fabius confessed, his tone betraying a hint of admiration for the crude simplicity of physical torment. The diversity of my tools reflects the complexity of the human sensory system. Each instrument is designed to explore a different facet of pain or manipulation, ensuring that no aspect of the subject's psyche or physiology is beyond my reach. Fabius's genetic research made it possible for him, if not to create, then at least to clone Primarchs. And at Fulgrim's request, Fabius brought into the world the first Primarch clone, creating a copy of Ferris Manus, whom Fulgrim tried to sway to his side again and killed after he refused. Fabius created several copies of Ferris, and all of them rejected Fulgrim's offers before being killed. Fabius proved to be vital to the Emperor's children. During the heresy, he revived Eidolon and Lucius at the request of their Primarchs, and Fabius took part in the Siege of Terror. Although neither he nor his legion actually provided active support in the siege of the Imperial Palace. Instead, they focused on the extermination of the civilian population. Indulging in their hedonistic desires, the legion's unrestrained fervor resulted in the deaths of one million innocent civilians on the planet. Fabius seized the opportunity to conduct horrific experiments on the captives. Materials obtained after this massacre were turned into special drugs that intensified the Legionnaire's sense of ecstasy. Perhaps this served as the first example of Fabius's subsequent cruelty in experimenting on the population of entire planets during sieges. Fabius had a revelation about the futility of what the traitor legions were trying to accomplish. 
he left Terra before Horus's death, along with a retinue of followers. This action angered Fulgrim, who placed a bounty on his head. Despite all his twisted genius, Fabius couldn't withstand the loyalist crusade that began after the Siege of Terra. Revenge finally caught up with Fabius Bile in the Arden system, not for supporting a renegade Lord Tyrell, a figure not widely recognized in established law, but likely as part of his continuous quest for genetic material and experimentation facilities. The specific details about embryonic material, flesh processing plants, and cloning vats being destroyed in a single night could feasibly fit within the narrative of Fabius Bile's exploits, as his pursuits often lead him into conflict with various factions across the galaxy. Fabius Bile's relentless pursuit of forbidden knowledge and experimentation eventually led him into a dire confrontation in the Ardeen system. His actions there, likely in search of unique genetic materials and advanced cloning technologies, drew the ire of the Salamanders. Known for their unwavering commitment to justice and the protection of the innocent, the Salamanders sought to eradicate the blight of Fabius's experiments. Caught in the crossfire, his facilities were destroyed, forcing him to flee into the chaos of the warp. His ship, a haven for his dark research, found refuge in the Eye of Terror, where he continued his experiments amidst the warp's corruption. Here, in this realm of madness and despair, Fabius Bile lingered, surrounded by the remnants of his followers and the echoes of a once majestic Elder World, now a twisted reflection of its former glory, furthering his quest for perfection through the lens of heresy. Now they were ruined, an old world of seething madness, echoing with the cries of long-dead souls. For Fabius, the Eye of Terror became a sanctuary, a home, and a vast laboratory. He did not take command of the Emperor's children, rather, he continued to work closely with various factions, offering his services in exchange for protection and resources. His base symbolizes not just a physical stronghold, but a bastion of his unending quest for knowledge and perfection through the lens of heresy. Within this domain, surrounded by the remnants of the Emperor's children and other Chaos followers, Fabius Bile pursued his experiments in genetic manipulation and cloning, seeking to transcend the limitations of flesh and spirit in demonic harmony. Bile continued his work, trying to unravel the secrets of the gene seed and the Emperor's science of creating Primarchs. To this end, Fabius continued to clone the Emperor's sons. Having seized Horus's body on Molech, Fabius created a clone. This confused creature was found by Abaddon and slain by him in the Battle for Harmony. During the battle, it was revealed that Fabius had been attempting to clone several Primarchs from samples he had been collecting over the centuries. The result, however, was a collection of monstrous and deformed beings that were subsequently destroyed by Abaddon and his warriors. Irritated, Fabius claimed that he had significantly slowed down his work and was forced to flee. Ultimately, Fabius led a group of apothecaries from various legions on Urum. This formation became known as the Consortium. Soon, more and more apothecaries flocked to it, driven by the desire to learn more about the science of flesh, iron, and organs from the acknowledged master. The human body was a mystery, the key to which they dreamed of finding, and so they turned to the greatest specialist in the field. Soon Oleander Co. returned to Urum, once a former assistant of Fabius Bile, and found him undergoing a procedure to treat his own dying body. Master, you... I am dying. Bile gestured to himself with his hand. You sense it, don't you, Oleander? The stench of rotting flesh, the smell of preservatives. Death emanates from me, as befits a walking corpse. He smiled, and Oleander's hand instinctively reached for his sword. It was the kind of smile that seemed more fitting for a corpse than a living person. For a dying man, you look surprisingly healthy, Master. Don't call me that, Oleander. I haven't been your master for a long time. If you want to address me formally, use my rank, Chief Apothecary. Pass the forceps, please. Bile extended his hand. Oleander hesitated. The surgeon's agile limbs clicked and buzzed with a vaguely discernible threat. The instrument hovered over Bile as if it were an overly solicitous scorpion. Bile clicked his tongue. Oleander, have you ever seen a man dissect himself? Physician, heal thyself. The forceps, if you please. 
Oleander took the instrument and handed it over. Bile delved into the open abdomen and began poking around inside. If it hurt him, he didn't show it. Oleander wasn't sure if it was sheer force of will or dead nerves. Over the years, he had seen worse, but Bile's unsettling indifference combined with the disgustingly sterile smell of the operating theatre made him feel queasy. The sensation was oddly satisfying, even if it was distracting. I'm dying, Bile stated bluntly, a matter-of-fact tone in his voice. Slowly but surely, I suspect I'll die within a few centuries. This body, for a few decades at best, it's not my first and won't be my last. Oleander nodded. During his time with Bile, he had assisted with more than one brain transplant. Clone bodies didn't last long, especially considering Bile's penchant for modifications. So, the rate of degeneration is increasing, he inquired. Constantly, Bile replied. And so, I'll get straight to the point. Excuse me. Why have you returned, Oleander? What ingenious plan has taken root in the tasteless lump of flesh you call a heart? Perhaps I simply missed your wise counsel, Master. One of the surgeon's insect-like limbs darted toward Oleander, and the blade mounted on its end touched his jugular notch. The warrior stilled. And perhaps I'm not in the mood for your pleasantries, Bile said. Answer, or I'll add your throat to my collection. Taking a cautious step back, Oleander said, I have a proposal for you, Master. A mutually beneficial deal. Oh, really? And what can you offer me? Eldar. Bile didn't laugh. Oleander took it as a good sign and continued. A craft world, weakened and ripe for the taking. As Bile turned back to his work, Oleander continued, aware of the jarred specimen's gazes upon him. The anticipation of their fates sent a shiver down his spine. And why would a craft world interest me, Oleander? Bile inquired, not looking up. I can give you a dozen answers, Master. I asked for only one, and stop calling me that, it's tiresome. Raw materials, Oleander ventured, seeking to capture Bile's interest. A good answer, but I have no shortage of them, as you can see. Bile waved his hand towards the shelves filled with horrors. Did you know that the untouched crypts of Urum on this planet alone hold thousands of Eldar mummified remains, preserved in darkness? Mummified is good, but fresh is better, said Oleander. It was the first thing candidates in the Apothecarium learned. Fresh materials are always preferable to those that have lost their quality, especially for physiological research, and not just bodies. Along with them were stored millions of those unusual stones that the Elder value so much. Do you remember Idris and how our brothers used to crack them open to try the hidden wonders inside? Bile asked. I remember, Oleander replied. Even after so many years, he still felt the taste of soul stones on his tongue. Just the thought of them made him salivate. He didn't know they were stored below. On the other hand, Bile always hoarded secrets like a miser hoards gold. By asking one simple question, he could learn more than an ordinary apothecary with a whole laboratory. But he never shared the results, and only applied them when circumstances demanded it no sooner. I have no doubt, Bile assured. The ones here, unfortunately, are broken. I could use some whole ones and a few other things. Your proposal deserves attention. Congratulations, Oleander. You'll live a little longer. As I've been informed, you're pursuing an extremely elusive prey, Kasparos. A prey that has forced you to leave the safe expanses of Eye of Terror and approach the borders of real space, Oleander continued. The craft world, nodded Kasparos. That's the one. Do you know how to find it? Oleander asked. I do. The location of our target is stored here, said Bile, producing a portable data slate from his cuff. It contains a copy of everything the brainworm extracted from the Corsair's head, as well as an approximate layout of its upper levels. Enough to devise an attack plan if you're still interested in such things. How did you obtain this? Kasparos asked, his eyes fixed on the data slate. Simply put, I took it. We have a captive. We copied all her memories and thoughts regarding your worldship, both conscious and unconscious, Bile replied. A captive, Eldar, Kasparos clarified, and Oleander could clearly hear the greed in his voice. Just like Bile, he smiled. A captive, let's leave it at that. He waved the data slate. Take it, Kasparos. Let it be a symbol of my good intentions in this joint venture. Kasparos took the data slate and, squinting, tapped it against his lips. Why didn't you tell me right away that you had a captive? He asked. Bile shrugged. Because I still need her. By the way, 
The world is called Luganath. I know what it's called, Kasparos replied. And do you know what it means? Bile chuckled. The light of fallen suns or something along those lines. Quite expressive, don't you think? It's symbolized by the black sun, which is itself a metaphor for past glory. Well thought out, isn't it? Kasparos smiled. Yes, not bad. The fallen sun, well, I'll become a new sun and illuminate them all with my rays, he said, turning his gaze to Oleander. What do you think, Oleander? Will they be pleased to see me? But I think by that time most of them will be dead, so it doesn't matter, Oleander remarked. Kasparos laughed. How do I know you're not deceiving me? It's a deal, Bile replied. You to me, me to you. Psychically shielding their fleet with the cacophony of a noise marines in conjunction with Eldar technology, the Emperor's children fleet remained undetected by the craft world as it approached. However, once they were spotted visually by the escort vessel, the Eldar managed to destroy the initial wave of fighters. Yet, a vast number of Chaos Space Marines dropships breached the craft world's hull. After a successful boarding action, the Emperor's children managed to establish a teleportation beacon on one of the platforms, thus summoning their main forces, including squads of noise marines. The combined efforts of the cacophony triggered a psychic explosion that shattered the craft world's structure. The artificial world suffered such damage that its artificial gravity constantly fluctuated, hurling ships from side to side like in a storm, making engagements even deadlier. However, the Eldar managed to divide the forces of the Emperor's children, isolating the glorious king from the main forces and destroying him before he could ascend. After this, Fabius's squad encountered a group of Harlequins, where the true intentions of Oleander were revealed. The game is finally becoming clear, he said. I've long wondered, what's the point of all this talk about the Legion and Brotherhood, Oleander? I must admit, well played. Attacking from all sides and none at once, he's so tired. Since terror, he's felt so tired, as if all his sins had suddenly come crashing down on him. Congratulations to you. I've only done what you taught me, only what I must for the patient's good. What have you done, brother? Arian asked. Isn't it obvious? said Bile. He made a deal with those devils, traded us for these chatty clowns, and now they've come to collect. Traitor, Savona growled. She wanted to lunge at him, but Merrick grabbed her and shook his head. Under Bile's gaze, she calmed down. Of course I made a deal with them, replied Oleander. With their magic, they saw this attack long ago, if not centuries. The likelihood of an attack, at least, he turned to Bile. I told you the Glorious One is charismatic. In a couple of centuries, he would have become invincible and gathered a fleet capable of smashing this pitiful half-world to pieces. But now he's dead, and the Eldar are no longer threatened. And we have an army in need of a new leader. A leader who can pull them out of the fire, save them from extinction, show them the better way. You said Arian. No, brother. Him, replied Oleander, pointing at Fabius Bile. It must be you, my lord. Of all who remain, only you have the capability. When this warband becomes yours, you can gradually rebuild a legion piece by piece. You can heal us, Chief Apothecary. You can make us whole. All of this was done for you. And whose idea is this? Bile asked, pondering over the visions in the Grove of Crystal Seers. Yours, Oleander, or theirs? I'm uncertain, Oleander responded, surveying their surroundings. Is that of consequence? What's evident is the opportunity now before you to reclaim what was lost. In your grasp, you hold the potential for rebirth. The Twelfth Company endures, wounded, yes, but unbroken. With their support, we can unite the remnants. We shall resurrect the Third Legion, heal the fractures. Consider the possibilities awaiting if you choose to shoulder this responsibility. Ha! Huh. Bile interrupted him. There it is. The trap. The Xenos clapped her hands together. Not a trap, Fabius, but a role. A role meant for you, the role of your entire life. When, oh, when will you start playing? What is she talking about? asked Sakara. About the trap, Bile replied. The burden of command. Healing. Reviving the third will take all my remaining strength, and I'll have to sacrifice everything I've worked for, almost like last time. My lord, I believe I asked you not to call me that. Bile said, grabbing Oleander by the throat. If only I had the opportunity, I would reshape every blood-stained page of our history towards perfection. He hissed. 
his grip tightening around his former student. The ceramite of the armour creaked ominously under his fingers. Close to his ear, the voice of the apothecary, imbued with a cautionary tone, broke the tension. But such an opportunity is beyond our reach. You cannot perfect what has already succumbed to the annals of death. You're just wasting my time. Glancing over his shoulder, he noticed something green flickering. The Harlequin were converging on them, perhaps for another fight or perhaps just to see what would happen next. After all, they didn't want to kill him. He looked up at the creature perched on the fallen column. There's your goal, he said, raising his staff. You want me to waste my time? What little I have left, trying to resurrect the dead. Isn't that what apothecaries do? The elder asked with a ringing laugh. Have we erred? Have you fallen so low that you don't recognize your purpose when it finds you? We offer you life and you call it death. I know my purpose better than you, clown, Bile laughed. You saw a future where poor Kasperos destroys this world. I wonder what did I do in that distant future that scared you so much that you're now trying to chain me to my old work? He threw Oleander to the ground and raised his hands. No, don't answer, I know. I'll build a better future on the bones of the present, even if it costs me my life. There are no other options. There are always choices, she replied. Her voice no longer held any mirth, not a hint of laughter. Bile suddenly realized that he'd committed the worst crime. He had deviated from the script, and he responded to her inscrutable silver gaze with a wicked smirk. Inside, a wave of satisfaction surged. He had never liked following beaten paths. Not for me, replied Bile, lowering his hand to the injector. Stimulants raced through his veins, and the chirurgeon whimpered cautiously. Bile paid him no mind. He needed the stimulants for a little while longer. Let the galaxy burn. I will survive. My work will survive. Humanity will survive because of me. But you, I'm afraid, will not. He snatched the injector at enhanced speed and fired. The Harlequin, letting out a piercing scream, jerked and fell, disappearing from view. He wasn't sure if he hit her, but it didn't matter. Through the dust and rubble came angry shouts. Soon the entire troop would descend upon them. What have you done? exclaimed Oleander. What I always do chose his own fate, replied Bile, gesturing towards the nearest talon of Horus. We're leaving now. Stay or come with me, it's up to you, he added, looking at Savona and Merrick. The Kasparos is dead, and your comrades are either dead or will soon be. Gather whoever you can if necessary, but we need to leave now and quickly if we want to survive. After these events, Fabius returned to his research until his flaws manifested again. And Fabius Bile died, not for the first time, and most likely not for the last. As such was his fate in the universe. Fabius Bile died. But not for the first time, and most likely not for the last, for that was his fate in the universe. He did not see death as an end point, but as a period of forced rest, of quiet inactivity, when the mind withdrew into itself like a mollusk hiding in its shell. In the free time that appeared to him when he was dying, Fabius surveyed the vast storehouses of knowledge within himself. In this kind of leisure, he found some semblance of consolation. But behind this feeling lay the certainty and realization that the universe would continue to exist without him, that the unfolding events would cycle through unpredictable scenarios, probably jeopardizing epical works, all that required a steady hand and a sound mind, and that, too, was the nature of the universe. Equilibrium could not last indefinitely. Anarchy in the future, inevitable and inescapable, was only moments away. It was only through his diligence that this catastrophic moment could be delayed. At least, that's what he convinced himself in moments of indulging his ego. In truth, he knew he could no more hold back the influx of entropy than a king could hold back the waves of the sea. Everything was disintegrating. Change is the only constant in an impermanent universe. A flame that consumes all things, leaving only ash, but after every fire, life sprouted again. What once existed would reappear, but in a stronger and stronger form to better withstand the eternal cosmic fire. Among others, these undoubted facts comforted Fabius while he lingered in the grey area between life and death. He, or rather his mind, the part of him that was still conscious despite the cessation of biological functions, wandered through corridors of stone and shadows, where he felt the touch of lightning and heard the stench of wet dog hair. 
These were old memories, older than himself, buried in the blackest depths of his soul. From there he could hear scraps of songs and echoes of words, incomprehensible, muffled by the passage of time. Wandering through the recesses of his mind, Bile kept asking himself, how had he died this time? He assumed it had not been violent. This kind of death invariably left a distinctive trail of red clouds in the grey haze. No, now his body must have simply given up. It had happened more and more often in recent years. Fabius was being devoured from within by a malignant plague that even he could not cope with. A wormhole on the heart of eternity, turning him inside out. As soon as Apothecary came to his senses, he was informed of the coup in progress. The rebels saw a chance to take control of the situation after the events on the Eldari ship and seize the ship and take revenge on their former oppressors. Fabius had no intention of tolerating any more disorder on his ship and decided to enlist the help of the distraught dreadnought Diomat. Old Apothecary, the amplified voice sounded especially loud in the stifling silence of the cell, echoing off the broken columns and making the ruined façade of the building vibrate. You're back. Yes, Fabius said, waving for Arian and the others to stay close. It's been a long time since we last spoke. Not that long ago. Diomat studied him intently, illuminating Bile's face and armor with the purple glow of optical sensors. It was his new man. Fabius Bile's ultimate goal has been to create a new post-human species, who are genetically engineered beings designed to surpass both humans and space marines in all aspects. Diomat was encased within a machine, such as a dreadnought, which was a common occurrence for severely wounded space marines. Have you come to mock me, Fabius? Have I ever mocked you, brother? You mock me by not giving me what I desire. What is it you desire? Freedom. The word came like a thunderclap. The chains jingled. Diamat clenched his powerful claws. Its heavy armament had been stripped away, leaving only a pair of manipulators suitable for close combat. But even without weapons, the venerable ancient was incredibly dangerous. I offered you part of my ship, brother, part of my domain, to take you wherever you want to go if you find my company burdensome. That's not what I mean. I know, Fabius nodded, but I won't go through with it. I don't want to lose you, brother. I don't want to throw you away like you're just a rotting piece of meat. You can still be useful, brother. Useful to you? That's true, but it could be worse. Fabius spread his hands wide. Do your old oaths mean so little, brother? I am Lieutenant Commander of the Third Legion. Before that might have earned your loyalty, if not your trust. Trust. It is for the living. Release me, brother. Send me to a dreamless sleep, so I may finally escape this nightmare of our own making. If you want, I'll do it. I'll put an iron bolt through what's left of your skull and put the remains in my organ bank. I will end your story dishonorably, as you seem to want. Is there nothing left of you, brother? Of you, the hero of Walpurgis? Diomat stared at him in silence. Fabius continued to bend his line. Or else you can do what you and I were created to do. Help me, Diomat. Help me save this poor universe from itself. Help me to save humanity, to pull it out of the darkness and back into the light. Help me, my friend. Silence. Then a sound, a sharp ringing. Fabius realized that Diomat was laughing. We have never been friends, as far as I can remember. Were we? No, Fabius smiled crookedly. In that case, I'd like to correct that omission. A friend, you say? Then grant me the favor I ask, and we shall be as brothers. I'm not going to kill you. I'm sorry. But at least grant me the favor of choosing where I die, brother. When and where I please. Give me that opportunity, and I will side with you. Fabius chuckled. A fair request. When this matter is resolved, I give you my word, your death will be your burden and only. There was another stretch of silence. For a moment, Fabius feared that Diomat had fallen into the dreamless sleep to which many ancients inevitably succumbed. Then the huge head nodded slowly. Agreed. Take these chains off me and tell me who I should kill first. After suppressing the rebellion, Fabius encountered a Harlequin unit under Silandri in one of the sorties, but was rescued by Flavius Alconex for the sole purpose of capturing and delivering Fabius to Adelon in the Chanting City for a Harmony. 
At the meeting, Eidolon informed Fabius that he had discovered the lost gene seed of the Emperor's children, which was pure and unaffected by the warp's influence. He needed Fabius to breed a new wave of Astartes, with which he believed the Third Legion would rise from the ashes. Flavius Alconex was to stay near Fabius so that the latter would not have a chance to break the deal. Before leaving the Harmony, Fabius decided to take one last look at his former laboratory and found something that should have been destroyed long ago. With surprise, he touched the slippery surface of the feed tank, slick with condensation. He wiped away the excess moisture and jerked his hand away. Something inside moved restlessly in its sleep and turned its all-too-perfect features toward him. It was pale but not sickly, the pallor of marble. Tiny, sturdy limbs clung to a narrow chest. Dark purple eyes glimmered beneath closed eyelids, and the fine hair on his head was white as snow. A perfect infant of a few months old, healthy and strong. Fabius drew in air through his teeth with a whistle, realizing who it was. Fulgrim, he exhaled and wiped the drops off the armoured glass. The fact that the young Primarch had survived after all this time seemed inconceivable. Apothecary looked down and saw that the mutants had somehow managed to craft a power supply and plugged it directly into the grid. It didn't draw much power, but it was enough to keep the system running. No wonder you haven't grown up, Fabius said softly. It was all they could do to keep you alive. He turned to the mutants. They were still bowing to the ground, muttering praises and pleas for mercy. In that moment, he felt something like pity for them. They had kept faith in him even after all these years. But most importantly, you're alive. The power source groaned again and sparks flickered along the cables. The lights inside the container flickered, signaling that it was about to shut down. Fabius now seemed to realize why he had been brought here. To see for himself the end of his creation's futile efforts to preserve his legacy. Realizing this, he stepped back, full of uncertainty. The nutrient gel began to darken as the oxygen disappeared from it. The filters that ensured the sterility of the solution began to fail one by one. The child inside twitched, slowly gasping for breath. A few more moments and it would die unless the power supply was restored. So be it. It had lived too long as it was. Fabius turned away, not wanting to see this. It was all in the past. He couldn't go back, not now. Still, he didn't want to see his dream die. There was nothing pleasant about it, just a long overdue end. What kind of kingdom is this without a king? Came a crackling voice in the Vox. Each word sank into him like a blade. What is an army without its commander? What kind of sons are these, lacking a father? Fabius Bile snapped, his frustration evident as he noted the increased heartbeat of his captive or experiment. What kind of dreamer is this? Without a dream! Fabius roared and turned sharply on the spot. The torture rod sliced through the air with a screech of split molecules. The reinforced glass cracked and shattered, contaminated solution gushing from within. The tank emptied quickly. Fabius found himself in the path of the stinking stream. The infant was carried toward him on a wave of his own excretions. Apothecary gently caught the half-awakened child and cradled its fragile body against him. Fabius glanced down at his burden. Violet eyes stared back at him with nothing but naive amazement in them. The child was dirty from head to toe, but still beautiful. That was one of Fulgrim's qualities, to look his best even in the worst of moments. Tiny hands clutched at Apothecary in search of protection. Fabius frowned and shook his head. So what now? he muttered. Fulgrim's only response was a joyful humming, hoping to use the lost gene tithe and Fulgrim to restore the Emperor's children to what they once were. Bile has left harmony. Fabius safely concealed the fact that he had a living, unspoiled Fulgrim clone. And since he didn't know what to do with him, he set about training him. Hello, Fulgrim. What have you learned today? Uh, that the world is much bigger than I imagined it to be. Fulgrim said, tossing aside the infoplate or what looked like one. Huge, noisier, more interesting, Fabius grinned. That's exactly how it is sometimes. He raised an eyebrow questioningly when he saw the stack of information tablets around the clone. The few printed books Fabius owned were pulled from the shelves, 
and stacked haphazardly in a slightly smaller ring. How many books have you read? Most of them. And some of them I feel like I've read before, in my dreams. Why do I feel that way? Fabius hesitated. I don't know, the lie tasted sour. This creature was and wasn't Fulgrim at the same time, so lying to him was torture for Fabius. He had often lied to the real Primarch, but by then it was no longer his Primarch, but something else. Something that encouraged deception and only called out the worst in his sons. Then a thought occurred to Fabius. This androgynous child before him was more deserving of being called Fulgrim than that spawn of the abyss that was currently cloaked in that name. Or would deserve it when he reached adulthood. The young man will not be the man they remembered, but perhaps he will turn out to be the Fulgrim he was originally meant to be. A true educator, capable of leading the new humanity to the great destiny prepared for it. One story popped into Fabius's mind. One he must have heard as a child. A tale of misty Albia. An enchanter raised a king, and a golden age came. There had been no happy ending, for that was rare in such stories. But now it was no fairy tale at all, and he was no wizard, guided by omens and grey wisdom. And the creature sitting before him was not a man though he could have been a king or an imperial throne. You're smiling, Fulgrim observed, and Fabius blinked, startled by his thoughtfulness. The child blurted out a smile, and Bile's hearts snapped in their cages of bone and malice. Smiling is good, teacher, it's better to smile. The clone reached for another clipboard. Yes, Fabius nodded. Stand up. The boy obediently rose to his feet, and Fabius began to gently examine him. Fabius clicked and hissed, taking blood and skin samples, but Fulgrim didn't even move. Meanwhile, the diagnostic scanners embedded in Fabius's armor recorded and analyzed the clone's biometric data. Extend your arm. Fingers probing Fulgrim's arm for any imperfections in its musculature. Fabius suddenly found himself mentally returning to Harmony's fall and Abaddon's rampage, to a moment of clarity for which he never thanked the Master of War. Resurrecting Horus had been a fool's errand. To think of Lupercal being reborn and the legions united. That had been the dream of a very different man desperately searching for some purpose in a meaningless universe. Those days now seem like a bad dream, a kaleidoscope of broken memories. He had been wrong. He saw it clearly now. Turn around. Fulgrim turned around smoothly, and Fabius probed the muscles of his shoulders and back and ran a few more scans. His thoughts were still occupied with the past. Rebirth of Horus now would only bring new problems, new strife. But could the same be said for Fulgrim? The true Primarch was now lost to them, turned into a capricious pervert completely given to voluptuousness and excess. But this Fulgrim is not yet given over to vice, and perhaps never will be lost if Fabius is careful. Apothecary stepped back. Good, you may return to your studies. Following Eidolon's coordinates, Bile and his squad found themselves on the Necron's world Solemnity. On its surface, they found a Necron's tomb that looked more like a museum than a standard tomb. Surrounded by Xenos, the true purpose of Flavius Alconex was revealed, namely to kill Fabius when the opportunity arose. But Dreadnought Diamat, whom Fabius persuaded to come along, saved him from the assassination squad. You. You're alive, wheezed Diomat in a weak voice. What was left of his chest heaved slightly, releasing black tarry blood with each exhalation. Thank you, brother, Fabius said, then added uncertainly. But why? The wrinkled, haggard face took on a horrified expression. Fabius realized that the ancient was trying to smile. I told you I would help you, Fabius. I'll help you save our legion, and I have succeeded. A wrinkled, frail hand rose from the murky mortar and clung to his shoulder with difficulty. I saved you, so that you could save them. The clouded gaze cleared a little, the disfigured eyes sparkling. You must do this, brother. You're the only one who can. I've always known that, and it's always irritated me. But the time for anger has passed. Diomat, you must let me... began Fabius. He knew the ways of keeping the inhabitant of a damaged amniotic womb alive. The methods were far from pleasant, and Diamat would not thank him, but still Fabius was determined to try. The shriveled hand tightened its grip and the tortured face grimaced. No, not again, not again. I'm not afraid of pain now. I have nothing to worry about anymore. My story is completely written. Let it be. Let it be over. Let it stay as it is. 
Diamat convulsed, his frail limbs slamming against the walls of the sarcophagus. Remember your promise, he suddenly shouted. You promised... His voice rose to a throbbing roar. In that instant, Fabius needed no sensors to understand the pain the mangled warrior was feeling in these final moments. The Elder Apothecary freed himself from the hand that had grabbed him, stepped back and pulled out an acupuncturist. I remember, farewell brother, accept my thanks. He fired, and Diomat's death cry was instantly silenced. With a pitiful cough, the puny body settled into its tomb. Fabius lowered his weapon. It seemed he had never felt so hard to part with someone, even though he had only known Diamat for a measly few centuries. The tragedy of the moment was interrupted by a stranger who appeared from the shadows. He turned out to be Trazin, who was eager to add to his collection of the greatest apothecaries in history. Fabius was able to bargain his life away in exchange for a squad of harlequins who were after him. Ah, the Eldari, sneaky little vermin, always so cunning, so prickly, they often wound themselves as much as their enemies. Trazin turned away, watching as more and more screens unfolded around him, showing the intruders from every angle. I have several factions in my collection, but this is the first time I've seen these garishly dressed ones. Would Apothecary like them? Fabius jumped at the opportunity. Trazin turned to him sharply. You speak as if they were yours. Apothecary shrugged. It is my business to offer. The Necron stared at him unblinking for a few moments, but then turned back to the surveillance transmissions. Curious creatures, aren't they? So enlightened and therefore so selfish. In my opinion, that was the main reason for the war with them. Their unwillingness to share the universe. It was that greed that sealed their demise. And here they are today in decline. Trazin reached out as if wanting to grab the translucent images, but the metallic fingers passed harmlessly through them. They are rarely caught among the stars. All the more reason to catch them while they're very near. And what are you hoping for with such a, a generous offer? The captor asked with a sneer. He seemed to delight in his own arrogance. I want safe passage back to my ship. Deal. Trazin tapped the ground with the blunt end of his staff. I'm going to need your help, though. He glanced furtively at Fabius. After all, it takes worthwhile bait to catch a pest. Back on the ship, Fabius found Flavius Alconex, trying to take over the ship in his absence. While the Fulgrim clone had already gotten strong enough, gathered the ship's crew to confront Flavius Alconex. However, Fabius saw the clone not as the hero Fulgrim, the Phoenician, but as an arrogant being easily seduced by false promises, a monster who valued his own perfection above the lives of his sons. Fearing that the clone would follow the same path as the original Fulgrim, Fabius decided to renegotiate his deal with Trazin, trading the clone along with the Legionnaires for what is described as the Lost Gene Tithe. I would like to renegotiate our deal. In lieu of my clone, I ask that you take it. He blurted out the sentence in a rapid-fire voice, not believing he'd said it out loud. At that moment, something in him cried out in despair, but he silenced that voice. It was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do. Fulgrim gave him a puzzled look. What? Fabius? He took a step towards him, and Bile backed away. Fulgrim frowned like a child, perplexed, confused, dumbfounded. He didn't understand anything, nor could he understand. He was a child, after all. Don't, Benefactor, don't do this. I have to, for you, for all of them. Fabius Bile had an epiphany, recognizing the madness that had ensnared them all, including himself. He nearly reverted to his previous ways, almost allowing the future to be consumed by the flames of Fulgrim's corrupted resurrection. His life's work threatened to unravel. Everything he had endured and aspired to achieve could be undone by the entity before him. Igori, his new men, in his mind, he envisioned them prostrating before Fulgrim, degrading themselves. He could not let this occur. It was simply not permissible. A curious proposition. Trazin scrutinized the Primarch. Centuries ago, I was close to adding such a creature to my collection. Are you sure? It is yours? Fabius stood up, clutching Igori to his chest. I thought he might be useful, but now I see I was wrong. Fulgrim trembled, his eyes widening in amazement. He drew his sword. Master, what are you even talking about? I did all this for you and you're not happy? What have I done wrong? Nothing. 
Fabius struggled, and the word spilled bitter venom on his tongue. You didn't do anything wrong, but it was a mistake. I must correct it. Flavius Alconex also jumped to his feet. Fabius, I don't know what diabolical bargain you made with this creature, but come to your senses. Don't do this. Whatever is going on between us, please don't do this. The Clone Lord paid no attention to him. Come on, Trazin, take him, damn you. Don't take him away from us again, Fabius, exclaimed Flavius Alconex and drew his sword. Damn you, listen to me. Fulgrim turned around, intending to stop him, but the Prefect was already moving towards the apothecary. A mask of grief froze on his face. Trazin laughed softly and made a single movement as Flavius Alconex charged at Fabius with his blade drawn. In the next instant, Flavius, as well as Fulgrim and the rest of the Emperor's children, froze like flesh and blood statues. Primarch, who maintained a puzzled look, looked like a child being reprimanded for something he did not understand. For a few moments, Trazin admired him. Exquisite. Fabius looked at the Necron. Bring the others with you, if you wish, for they long to be near him more than anything else. Primarch and his faithful mutts will make a delightful composition. Much obliged, Clone Lord. It is truly magnificent and will make a fine addition to my collection. Your bounty has already been transferred to the cargo holds of this vessel. Congratulations. Good. Now get off my ship. After these events, Fabius Bile decided to enhance his knowledge by journeying to Comora. He managed to infiltrate the Dark City by capturing a Drukhari warship and forcefully entering. The Himonculi were impressed by his audacity and knowledge and agreed to teach him their arts. He studied in the Tower of Flesh, under the tutelage of Hexacurex of the Coven of the Thirteen Scars. However, when Bile felt he had absorbed all he could from the Drukhari, he resolved it was time to depart. Ingeniously, he instigated a conflict between the Cabal of the Katai and the Cabal of the Stolen Consciousness. Using the ensuing chaos as a smokescreen, he escaped from Camorra. The Coven of the Thirteen Scars swore vengeance upon him. During the events of the Psychic Awakening, Fabius stole a prized artifact from the Death Guard known as the Terminus Est. This action prompted Typhus and his Plague Fleet to pursue Bile, forcing him into an alliance with Argal Tal and his warband. During the ensuing conflict, Bile was able to manipulate all parties to his advantage. The warband was transformed into a host of grotesques, and Argil Tal himself faced a tragic fate. During the battle on Burnscore Prime, Bile managed to capture several Adeptus Custodes and Sisters of Silence, taking them as subjects for experimentation. In the war's final phase on Dessa, Fabius again managed to escape as the forces of the warband, Death Guard and Custodies decimated each other. With the specimens acquired, the apothecary returned to his base to commence a new project.